Welcome to New Thinking for a New World, a Tilburg Foundation podcast. I am Alan Stoga, your host. Each week, I bring you conversations with people who think differently about the great issues that are shaping our world. Geopolitics, disruptive tech, mass migration, the changing climate, culture wars, all of it is grist for our mill. I hope you enjoy listening. I also hope you will let me know what you think and that you join the conversation at telbergfoundation.org. And now for today's episode of New Thinking for a New World. Margaret Bowman, global pioneer in forest canopy ecology, arbonaut, author, educator, looks at the world from the top down, literally. Her key insight was simple. Most of what happens in a forest occurs at the top of trees, which means that the most interesting science needs to be done up there. The consequence has been a string of scientific discoveries, and even more importantly, her deep realization of the critical role that forests play in sustaining global natural systems. A winner of the Telberg SNF Eliasson Global Leadership Prize for 2023, Meg recently shared her insights on forests, leadership, and encouraging girls to climb trees with new thinking for a new world. Please listen. I'm Alan Stoga, chairman of the Telberg Foundation, and today I am with Margaret Lohman, Meg Lohman, who is a winner of the 2023 Telberg SNF Eliasson Global Leadership Prize. Welcome, Matt. Thank you so much. I want to read the citation that the jury agreed on, on, on your award. Meg Lohman, founder of Mission Green, global pioneer in forest canopy ecology, arbornaut, author, educator. For her tireless and innovative scientific and advocacy work, to protect the planet's forests. So we're going to talk about trees today. Good evening. Why do you care? Oh, wow. What a, we have two hours or two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> we have as long as you want. That's fantastic. It's funny, but I think I wanted to be a tree person from age three. I was one of those little kids that climbed trees, but I grew up in a small town where we didn't have a movie theater or much to do. And so, small town in the US. Yes, in Nor New England, in upstate New York. And uh, trees were my friends. I was super shy and I loved going out into nature where nature didn't talk back or bully you. And I convinced a couple of my girlfriends to build little rudimentary tree forts. So, there we were, you know, looking at little bird nests. How ungirlish of you. Exactly. Very tomboyish, but. Um, it stuck with me, and of course, people said girls couldn't be science in my generation, scientists, sorry, and uh, so I kept thinking maybe I could be a park ranger, maybe I could just, you know, do some very small job in a state park somewhere when I grew up, but I kept studying trees, and lo and behold, when I got to college, I realized that people only looked at the bottom 5% of a tree. They never saw the whole tree, and so I ultimately made this crazy slingshot out of a piece of metal and made, sewed a harness with seatbelt webbing and borrowed a rope and became one of the world's first arbor nuts. How crazy is that? And have spent since then a lot of your life not at the bottom of the trees, but at the top of the tree. Right, which I call full tree science because I can get to the bottom of the tree pretty easily. But the funny thing is foresters for over 100 years really did look at the forest from the bottom, and nobody saw all the cool stuff at the top. It's the obvious question, what's the difference? What do, you, what do you see from the top down that you don't see from the bottom up? Well, when you think about it, all the action is at the top, practically. The light is hitting the top of the tree. The leaves are growing up there. So the pollinators are there, and the things that eat pollinators are there, and the flowers are up there, and all of the amazing interactions of wildlife. And so lo and behold, those few of us who were arbornauts in the 1980s discovered that about half of the species on the planet live in the top of the tree. My goodness. And only 1% of light hits the bottom of a tropical rainforest floor. So 100% light at the top, you can just appreciate that that's where all the action would be, where the sunlight works. I've been in tropical forests, and they're dark. 
there's endless sunlight, except none of it, as you just said, a right. fraction of it gets gets to the bottom. right. And here's a cookier thing, you know, we he had scuba invented in the 1940s and coined the word aquana, and we went to the moon in the 1960s, but it wasn't until the 1980s that we actually explored the top of trees, hence that word arbor not. And that's why I call it the eighth continent, because it's this whole new world of exploration. I'm recruiting elf people because we need more explorers of the treetops because we're fighting a battle that we are losing the trees before we know what's up there. I want to go in two directions. Let's first go with losing the trees. You have a horrible statistic to share. Yes, I did share that with the uh, Talver group that in my lifetime, 50% of the world's forests have been cut down. So that's a very sobering and disappointing statistic for those of us who know the value of trees. So essentially, since the mid-20th century, 50% of global trees, global right. forests are gone. Right. Accelerating or decelerating? Well, two things are important there. It's accelerating hugely. But the other issue is people say, oh, don't worry, we're planting trees. But when you think about it, a 200-foot high tree houses literally millions of species. And a little seedling will take a couple hundred years to ever attain that stature of supporting a community. So there's no substitute. We have new greenery coming in, but those species that live in the treetops could become extinct. They have nowhere to go. So we have to be really careful when people say, oh, don't worry, we're planting new trees. We're never substituting for those big grandfathers. What's and grandmothers. And grandmothers, yes. Uh, talk about science. What kinds of science are you and the other arbornauts doing up there on the top of the forest? First and foremost, it's a pretty inexpensive science because with a slingshot and a rope and a harness, you're on top. On top, and you know that most everything up there is new to science because nobody's been there before. So, give an example. Of what's new? What what have you discovered? Uh, probably thousands of bugs, insect species, because there are so many things specialized to the top of the trees. Some species of vines, which again only flower and leaf at the top of the tree. Cool, weird things like water bears, which are extreme organisms that live in drops of water on leaves and orchids and mosses. So there are a lot of things specific to the tops of trees, but we almost never knew about it. And this, obviously, different kinds of forests have different host different kinds of bugs and flowers and vines. Um, those are tropical. You most sounded like those most in tropical forests. Surprisingly, we have over 60,000 species of trees. No, no. Well, you didn't, but each one has a different community, right? It's kind of like every town has a different population. And a few things might be the same, uh, maybe the same species of mosses or something. But most of the insects are different that eat the leaves of that specific tree. And then a lot of the other organisms that live on the leaves are different. So we do we have a lot to learn still. And uh, one example is this crazy group called water bears, these little tardy greens. And I actually worked with wheelchair students because they never get a chance to climb a tree. And we piloted some methods with um, pulleys so they could get up trees. And they discovered new species in oak trees in Kansas, and redwood trees in California. So there are a lot of new things in common forests, not just the tropical jungle. In a sense, it's a bit like the work that some scientists, including some mutual friends, are doing in the oceans. Totally. They, these are pioneering. This is pioneering science in right. both in the water and on the top of the tree. And it's going somewhere that no one ever went. It's as simple as that. I'm not um, a rocket scientist. I guess that's a complex kind of science, but... I'm just a kid explorer, and that's why I encourage young kids to go climb a tree because they too could discover something new. So you're a scientist, you're also an educator, you're an advocate. Let's talk about advocacy. It's clearly trees matter to us, to the planet. Uh, there is, and you even see that on bumper stickers, you know, hug a tree, you go do, plant a tree. But as you just pointed out, Stopping destroying trees is probably where you would like to see this start. Right. right. And what, think, what are you doing to make that happen? 
So two things are important. We need to cut down some trees. People need to make a living. They need timber for their houses. But I think we've been cutting down forests willy-nilly without understanding their role. They're really a multi-million dollar machine working for us for free. They're cooling us with shade. They're cleansing our water through their canopy because rainfall has a lot of toxins in it now. They're producing oxygen, which we need. They're absorbing carbon dioxide from all our pollution and storing it, giving us 50% of our medicines, housing half of our world's species. And so all these values would be very hard to replicate with an artificial factory. And we probably don't learn that at school. I've lectured at a lot of business school and the business CEOs say, we thought a tree was just some enhancement of our real estate. We never realized it had such a potentially economic value if you were to add up all those wonderful things that trees do for us. Do you know leaders who, young or old, regardless of where they live or what they do, who are changing the world? Leaders who are not content with what is and are working hard for what could be? If so, please nominate them for the Telberg SNF Eliason Global Leadership Prize at telbergprize.org. The nomination period will open on March 15th. One of the tragic consequences of climate change as it's unfolding, of course, are massive wildfires for all sorts of reasons. Uh, we see it in Greece. We see it in California. We see it in Brazil. Um, those forest fires, we saw it in Canada this summer. We saw it in Siberia this summer, past summer. Uh, those forest fires are natural, air quotes, uh, incredibly destructive and must be accelerating the problem. So what do you do? Is it just inevitable that these forests are going to self-destroy? That's not quite the right word. Not at all. In fact, we have accelerated those forest fires. We have re-humanity. Re humanity. We fragmented the forest. So the forest is like a big sponge holding water in. But the minute you divide it into a hundred little tiny pieces, it dries out faster. It has more edge effect. So of course it burns more easily. We've contributed to warming and drying of the planet with our carbon dioxide and our different human activities, which in turn, warmer, drier conditions lead to more fire prone actions. So we really have to turn that around. It's a very devastating thing. And Lo and behold, we plant real estate near forests because it's quite lovely to do. And so we've put a lot of people in threat in places like California, where I used to live. They even planted eucalypts, which are trees that require fire to reproduce. They actually produce volatile oils that burn readily. So it sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Put a, you know, oily rags in your house and light a match, and that's what you're See what happens with a eucalypt. So we have a lot to learn about how to use our forests more wisely, and most of all, to try hard to ameliorate the fire activities, because we can at least minimize them. But with climate change, we have to really be more proactive. And now I'm going to be really pessimistic. I'm going to, do you think that's happening? Do you think people... No. Oh, I don't think good. it's good. I, I didn't have to finish. Yeah. I'm really sad. And I talk to a lot of school groups every week. I give Zoom calls to fifth graders because there's a couple children's books written about me and the teachers get hold of that. And I have to be hopeful in front of young people. But in my heart, I'm very worried because adults are still making the decisions. The kids aren't quite old enough to vote. And so we need more action. The funny thing is, we could just leave trees alone and they would help us fight climate change. You know, the shade, the holding of the moisture, the actual climate amelioration is fantastic with big trees, not plantations and not just little sticks that we plant, but keeping the larger trees and the whole forest remaining in the world and then maybe using the plantations for our management of resources would be fabulous. When you talk to governmental leaders in the United States and elsewhere, do they get it? Not really. It's still tough to give trees a monetary value in the Western world. But in a lot of cultures, trees have huge value. And so I've started talking to religious leaders 
and different groups of people who really value trees. And so 2 billion people need trees for spiritual worship in Africa, in Asia. And if we could only bring a little bit of that into our souls in the Western world, we would go a long, long way to helping save trees. I, I think there's a long list of things we ought to bring in our souls in the Western world. Is there, but I would add this to my list. Oh, head was, you must. What next? Gosh, what next is really, really tough to say. But a couple of things. Um, I do have hope in the next generation. We need to invest in their education. We need to bring more diversity to the decision-making table in conservation. It's pretty clear in my world that some 95% of those Decision makers are white males from the Western world, and we need women. Hey, some of my best friends are white males from the Western world. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, we need indigenous people at the table. We need young people at the table. We need what table, but what? But that, that, that. Yeah, I'm going to push. Right it. What table? There is no governance right. when it comes to climate. We have the COP process, and I've long argued anything that has a 28 after it isn't working. That's true. How do you get? And there's no answer to the question, so I apologize in advance. How do you get a table that actually can make decisions that are relevant to the, what's going on in the climate, what's going on in the forest? One thing is you give that leadership to the local people. You put that table out in the village, not in some governmental building a thousand miles away. And hence my program that I started called Mission Green, where we're building these canopy bridges donating them to local indigenous people, training the women to be guides, building ecotourism lodges. Well, in turn, where, where have you done this, for example? Oh, where are these? Where are these the Amazon, uh, in parts of, we're building one in Madagascar right now. We're planning to build one in India. Uh, we did have one built in the Redwood Forest. Presumably that's not a nation that he has a monetary need, but the good news is they've served as models to show how much local income can come through with these constructions and how local people could be employed. But we're pretty excited about building 10 of these walkways in the 10 most endangered forests of the world. And right now we're fundraising for Madagascar. We have one in Rwanda, we have one in um, Peru, and we have a couple in Brazil. And moving ahead with this notion, again, of that decision-making table being more at the local level, not someplace that's thousands of miles away. And these canopy bridges have both an economic function because it drives tourism, I assume. Correct. Uh, but also an education function because it gets, as you spend your life doing, people off the ground and up into right. the top of the forest. And if we can encourage tourism to visit the forests instead of always visiting Disney World or some game park. It would be a fantastic thing. And the third layer of success there is we can also fund students to be the explorers by giving them access to the canopy so they don't have to do crazy things like I did and make their own slingshots. Um, they can become... But had you not made that slingshot, you're not you. Well, that's so true. That's well, I just don't expect all the other young students to be that crazy. Um, so hopefully we can also inspire the next generation of scientists with these walkways too. You've used the word funding a couple of times. How do you get people with money or governments with money or foundations with money to recognize that this is work that's just not nice to have, but is essential to everything we've been talking about? It's a really tough sell to help uh, encourage people to fund a forest in Madagascar. Or a forest. Oh, I suspect it at least gets their attention, but then they say you're out of your mind. Exactly. And they say, why can't I find something at home, put my name on it, and get local glory? So that is a very tough sell. It keeps me awake at night. It's my biggest frustration. And a lot of times the success comes from their children first. And I mentioned to some of the Talbert folks the other day that some of my best donors are fifth graders who give their lunch money every year and they want to help save forests in Ethiopia or somewhere far away because they've read enough to understand that kids in other countries need oxygen and need their species and the pollinators in their garden. So if the kids can bring that home to mom and dad, that's really great. But I wish that adults had had more training in their youth about the value of trees. That's one limitation, I think, in our education is that we 
haven't given people enough planetary understanding. Oh, for sure, because otherwise we wouldn't be doing many of the things that we, and by we, I mean not just we happen to both be Americans, uh, but we Americans, we Europeans, we Africans, uh, planetary stewardship is pretty low on the, uh, on almost everyone's right. scale of right. far those. Correct. And I think, again, it's because we never gave a dollar value to what we call natural capital. These natural resources were free. You could pollute the stream with your factory. You could cut down the trees to build your mall, and nobody ever charged you for that privilege of taking away the nature. That's not going to change. Isn't it? I mean, why don't we think about the value? Yes, that's a good question. It has to be leadership. It has to be people who are leaders. And so then I say to myself, will it be the CEOs of companies like Seventh Generation and Patagonia and some of the other folks that are developing these B corporations or will they listen to the indigenous people who already know that saving their trees and keeping their water fresh is a valuable commodity? I'm, I'm not sure where that leadership will come from first, but we sure need it to happen fast. So maybe we can refer to the Talbert group. Well, I was about to say, I am a hopeful pessimist, but I'm a pessimist. So I am part of the reason why the Talbert Foundation does work in leadership space is that the board and I see too little innovative leadership, at least out of the political system. Uh, so we, for years now, with our prize, we've given, we've honored 24 people over the last decade. Not a single one has been a politician. Uh, I think of the uh, 100 plus, hundreds actually of finalists, one was a politician and got voted off the island very quickly by the jury. Uh, and that's because, for reasons that I, I really don't understand, our politicians are brain dead. Yeah. Uh, and I, when I say our, I mean politicians in any country, because we work, we tell we work globally. Yeah. But we find people like, not like you, but like you, uh, who are educators, who are scientists, who are religious leaders all over the place that are actually trying to do things like you're trying to do. Right. Um, my fear, this is the pessimist side of it. That was the hopeful side. The pessimist side is that I don't know if we have time. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and that's very scary. Uh, I work as a mom first, so a scientist second. I really value my children having a life, and that's why I'm so passionate about saving trees and trying to develop action plans for forest conservation. But I do really shake my head and wonder because somehow that message is not coming through and the dollar, the superficial monetary system is preventing it. And the politics, as you say, every politician gets in office and then spends three years trying to run again. And so somehow we haven't empowered them to really do good. We've, the system is broken a little bit, isn't it? On that hopeful note... <laughs> I, I, do, I want to finish there. And, and one last question. Ten years from now, what are you doing? Ten years from now, I don't Madagascar is done. We got Madagascar built by that. I'll have the ten most endangered forests, meaning forests with the highest biodiversity, but have very little left. In Madagascar, for example, there's less than 5% of their primary forest left. Those walkways will be built. The women and families in the nearby villages will be operating them and making a sustainable income. National Geographic will be funding 10 students at each walkway a year. And then I can go into the soil and have the earthworms decompose me. <laughs> on that happy note, on that happy note, I want to again congratulate you on being a winner of the 2023 Telberg SNF Elias and Global Leadership Prize and far more importantly for the work you're doing. So keep on climbing, Meg. Thank you so much. It's been really an honor to meet this leadership group and also to be you have the trees recognized, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of New Thinking for New World. I'm Alan Stoga, podcast host, and I look forward to your joining our next conversation. Remember, tell us what you think at telbergfoundation.org.